You are ready, we, we can begin. It's uh, 31 now. Okay. Okay. Um, see, the process is, now people are waiting at the lobby, so I'll allow them to come in, then all are online. And uh, you, right now you're on a live telecast on the Facebook. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just um, allow everybody to join, then we'll begin formally. Uh, welcome to MIT World Peace University and uh, particularly greetings from the School of Public Health. Joske has a long association with MIT World Peace University and uh, also she helped us to establish the School of Public Health and she also helped us to establish the Faculty of Sustainability Studies. She is one of a distinguished visiting faculty. She also works as the chair professor of uh, trans uh, transdisciplinary sustainability studies. Joski, it's a privilege to welcome you, and um, I look forward to listen to your wisdom. And uh, you are primarily talking to the MBA students, and also we have some uh, distinguished visitors. Like, uh, let me introduce, acknowledge the presence of Dr. Mina Cherian. She is from Geneva. She was for several years. She is a veteran WHO. So thank you for being with us. She is consistently support our program. And, um, and with, uh, without much ado, I would, uh, um, I, I would like to invite Joske. Uh, will you be able to introduce yourself in your own words for a few, few sentences, please? Thank you, Joske. Thank you very much, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here with you, here from Amsterdam in the Athena Institute, and you in Pune, where I've been so often. And it's a pity I cannot be more often these days due to COVID, of course. Yes, uh, we started an institute, Athena Institute, in the beginning of the 80s, with two people in the Faculty of Biology, and we were very much interested in, is it possible that in that for students, they can have more insight in what happens in society, what influence the sort of knowledge they get in their coursework and the research which they will later be involved in. And the students were very happy that it was not only science what they got, but that there were now some courses who linked the, the topics in science, for example, plant hormones, to agriculture and to uh, health issues and, and so on. And it started very, very small. And perhaps that is also a bit of inspiration for you, that even if you start something small, what you really feel is important and you can find some support, now this institute has grown till 100 uh, people who work here. And the mission of our institute is still the same. It's looking at diversity and inclusion in the innovation of uh, health and health science innovations and policy making, and also how this can be done bottom up approach, including many people. So now we have many PhD students. I finished now this year 50. The last uh, one was seven this years, so I was in interaction with students very much, and therefore I'm very happy to be here with you to see the stu new students 
of MIT and the new courses. And I think it's a very, very interesting course you are now starting with. And I hope in this lecture to give you a little bit of perspective from new developments. Is that enough? Yeah, and um, may, may I request uh, our students to switch on their um, video, but uh, switch off their um, microphone. So we could see, and um, I mean, we would like to see your face. And please, please go ahead. And remember all of you are live on Facebook. You can log on to my Facebook page, you are on live. Uh, this I should have been informed about it, but <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I just mentioned. Uh, I mean, by default, all no, the no, no. all the programs on Webex on a found these are open for uh, your privacy. So it's intuition to your privacy, but it's it's almost by default is taken for granted. So I'm sorry about Very it. And Very that's good. what I'm just informing everybody. All the sessions on um, on a webinar Webex is for the public and it's in the public domain. So it's all recorded. It will remain in the public domain. With that introduction, I request Joske to go ahead with the presentation. Joske, you have almost um, 45 minutes with you. Then we'll have a question answer from the student and also our other participants. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours, Joske. Oh, I'm Okay, um, there we are, and I'm very happy that I've seen already some of your faces. Um, it, it, it's it's very interesting to to see be with you, but also to speak about this topic. And I think it's a very important topic: dealing with complexity in public health. But why is it so important? Why can we say that complexity is the most critical issue in public health? It is because the complex nature of public health. The complex nature of public health, which shows this complexity, really directly influences the understanding of public health, the design process of the interventions, the pol and the policies, and also the way how the uh, public health programs can be upscaled. So, in short, in the field of public health, working means dealing with complexity. And here is the agenda. First, what I like to do is to, um, to find out what makes public health complex. What is it exactly and why is it a challenge? We will discuss two different ways in dealing with complexity, a traditional or monodisciplinary way and a new transdisciplinary approach. And we ask how these two approaches different in three domains. The public health interventions, how they are developed. And secondly, how does these approaches impact the education and learning in master programs? And finally, also very important, how does these approaches will affect your jobs, your working, conditions and what you can do to make really public health problems better understood and solved. And we have a question and answer session. But before I uh, start the next slide and we start reading, let me speak a bit about obesitas. One way of looking at obesitas is to see it as a clear and relatively simple problem. A problem of too high calorie intake. The solution of this problem is then also simple. It is to reduce the intake of calories. A completely other way of looking at obesitas is to realize that there are many different struggles with obesitas from young children, adolescents, elderly people, all these different behaviors and challenges. And that there are also a large number of actors involved parents, family in the first place, of course, epidemiologists, nutritionists, physical training experts, policy makers, but also organizations, governmental institutions, supermarkets, 
but also hobby clubs with their canteens and railway stations with an abundance of snacks. All these people and organizations have knowledge. And for finding solutions, different types of knowledge need to be integrated. And also important, all these factors can influence each other in a continuous way and lead to unintended negative side effects of policy options. This is a completely different picture than the calorie, simple calorie intake model. Let me take the second example here. This is an example of COVID-19 pandemic. All people are influenced by COVID-19, but in completely different ways, depending on whether they are men or women, rich or poor, child or adult, live in a house or on the streets, live in rural or in urban settings. Here also, we have a variety of stakeholders who have knowledge of developing solutions and the need to integrate knowledge from all these actors. An important question in both obesitas and COVID is how to realize this integration, how to do it. That's not an easy question and it boils down to the question, how can we make health work for all of us? Yes, how can we make health work for all of us? Broadly speaking, um, public health issues can be approached in a traditional or monodisciplinary way. The focus is, for example, on epidemiology, mental health, health finance, containment strategies, and a newer transdisciplinary way. Both approaches are very needed and important but they are different and require different skills. While monodisciplinary studies focus on understanding one specific part of a health program, transdisciplinary approaches are used to bring various views together and to make sustainable integrative solutions. If we look at the monodisciplinary approaches, that is one way of dealing with complexity. Um, that is a monodisciplinary approach to public health. This is basically what scientists usually do when they have a complex problem. Scientists break it, like to break it in different parts, which are less complex, easier to handle, and in doing so, sometimes creating even new scientific fields. The hope is that often in a later phase of study, integration of the results of their fields can be realized with results of other research fields. This approach has positive aspects because it is good to create and learn specific knowledge about one field. But there are also challenges with this approach. The hope to integrate in a later phase of study the results with the results of all the studies often does not work out. They know so little of the other fields that it is difficult to link the results in a meaningful way. Therefore, many public health scientists and professionals stay working in their own silos and often do not have enough insight also the public health problems in reality in the outside world. This traditional approach, monodisciplinary approach, hampers actually the usefulness of the developed health innovations and services, which therefore have limited lasting impact or are even never implemented. Other innovations who are successful may be plagued, who are successful may later be plagued by unexpected problems. An example is the vaccination programs. It's very clear that vaccination is important 
who can prevent diseases like measles, diphtheria, polio, hopefully soon also COVID-19. However, the vaccination programs have to face the fact that due to cultural, religious, and economic reasons, less people participate in the programs than expected, hampering the positive income impact of the vaccinations. Obviously, there was too much focus on the biomedical aspects and approach in comparison to other factors which could prevent vaccination for certain groups. Now, programs have been developed, for example, in Athena here in Amsterdam, how the knowledge and values of groups who are not reached can be included and integrated in the guidelines for vaccination programs. These experiences with biomedical or traditional approaches to public health has led the last 20 to 30 years to new models of public health, the so-called social ecological models. Social so ecological models stress that for understanding effectiveness of health, public health intervention, the interaction between the health of the individual and its environment, therefore the term ecological, need to be part of the analysis. Especially the social interactions are critical. The social interactions take place in the family, in the community, within different layers in the health system, at work. More broadly speaking, social ecological models take into account the interaction between health and social factors. To develop solutions to complex problems, knowledge integration from these different actors functioning at different levels in society is needed, as well as integration with problems of the real world. This integration with public health challenges in society can be realized through continuous participation of clients and stakeholders in the development of new public health interventions. And with the introduction of socio-ecological models, also called the new approach to public health, the process has been started from traditional or monodisciplinary to transdisciplinary learning and working. We will now discuss this new approach in a bit more detail. Question is, what does transdisciplinary public health look like? First, I discuss how processes from monodisciplinary work towards transdisciplinary work took place. We see on this slide visualizations and drawings on the process of mono, multi, inter, and transdisciplinarity and research and learning. In the mono field, in monodisciplinary research processes are visualized here as red and green and blue lines. These are all monodisciplinary lines of different scientific fields. The professionals and scientists work on the public health issues within the limits of their disciplines. They stay in, the, in, the, in their own discipline. They deal with their questions, how they are formulated, their concepts, their methodologies, and also looking at the research uh, journals. Um, each right, each scientist, group of scientific field, write a report in which uh, the, and often also articles in which recommendations are given to uh, practice but this is always from one perspective that is the essence of monodisciplinary so you have different advices then from different fields so the next uh, step 
when, when one realized that this was not very helpful to deal with the problems and that the elements of the fragmented knowledge was not directly helpful in dealing with the problem, people felt that there should be multidisciplinary research. And then we can have the same disciplines, but we need to organize a sort of interaction. So they develop teams in which the different groups now and then spoke about the mental health issue and how they addressed it. So they were together, they looked at each other's results, but still multidisciplinary, you work as it is usually defined, in, still in the confines of your own field. And you see that the multidisciplinary made now one report but the recommendations are still separate from, from the different perspectives of the different fields. So the next, um, oh. the next is interdisciplinary. People realize that it's not very helpful to be in a team and to ex exchange information, but not to cooperate more, to follow up on each other's uh, results and findings and questions. And then we have what we call interdisciplinary. Um, and here you see that the lines, it's, it's drafted like that, that the, the different lines are not longer straight and that one is not going only in one's own field, but tries to sit together at the beginning of the research or the project to think together from the different perspectives, but try to make up a shared problem, this, uh, problem definition, co problem conceptualization, and work together towards the results, the results in problem solving. And then you have separate elements of recommendations, but you have also an integrated form of recommendation. Now, this way, this process from Disciplinary to multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary is very interesting and it is also very courageous because the interdisciplinary people they uh, uh, have sometimes more difficulty in publishing articles in their journals, although slowly there are more and more um, new journals in that direction who allow interdisciplinary work. But still, you can understand that in order to really deal with a complex medical, uh, public health problem, it's not enough to look at the academic expertise only. In society, there are so many groups, in organizations, uh, individuals, even patients or clients and users. They may not have academic credentials, they have not, but they have a lot of experience. So why should their experience not be taken into account in order to, to develop a process in which all aspects of the problem can be better looked at. And that is what we call transdisciplinary research. So here you have scientists from different fields together with other actors at society who really know about how the problem functions into their organization can be done, what cannot be done, and so on. So this was the process from mono to transdisciplinary research. And now we will look a little bit in more depth in how does it look such transdisciplinary process for developing interventions, but also for you for in terms of education and and in terms of what it means for later you are working as a professional. How does it influence your work? Um, here we, um, we, what we have here is the core characteristics of transdisciplinary work. So what are the core concepts? So the first is the conceptual framework. We use a conceptual framework as a sort of lens of how to look at research, research we want to do. We do that all as scientists. We, we make clear how we look. 
And uh, what is the, how is the conceptual framework in transdisciplinary research developed? Um, it is very important that right from the beginning, all involved um, uh, actors, so the different scientists which are involved and the people out, uh, out so from society interact and make clear what are the critical elements they feel are essential for the problem and what sort of solutions they are thinking of and what should be the process of how to identify more specifically the problems and how to take which route to find these solutions. So that conceptual framework needs to have these elements in the re transdisciplinary research right from the beginning based on the information and discussion among all the different stakeholders. Then the complexity. Um, what often happens is that in such a discussion between different stakeholders, conflicting values come up and conflicting knowledge come up. And the most easiest seems to be to be friendly to each other and don't talk about it. But if you don't like the other values, if you don't like the other approaches, you sometimes don't talk about it. But here, if you want to do this complexity, it is important that you feel the end goal, the finding of the sustainable solution is so important that you are willing to discuss your conflicting values, that you are willing to say, well, I come from this background and I think this and this and this, and you say something completely different, what is completely new for me. And my feeling is that it perhaps should not be like that, but I'm open in a discussion. I want to listen to you and I want to understand why you feel that that is an important point or that we should pay attention to it. So that is an essential aspect of the complexity. The context is also in transdisciplinary research extremely important. The context in the context takes the innovations and the interventions place. The context of the policy process, the context of the implementation of the intervention, that is an extremely important issue, specifically if you would like to scale up later. Agency. Agency is important. What is agency? Agency is the participation between the different groups, the researchers, the practitioners, the policy makers, all representatives from society. And this participation is not only a formal participation that you can have a checklist and say, we participated, we have been there. No, it means that there are tools used to make this participation really work, to identify really what are the different issues for every stakeholder if we take this direction or that direction. And beginning of discussion and understanding and then identifying what are the problems and what are even underlying problems and underlying problems to get a better insight in them, there are validated tools for doing that. And then change. Change is really what um, oh, it, I think I need to approve something. Can you see, uh, Joe, what I need to approve? Requesting to no, don't, don't worry about it. It's some kind of uh, interface. It's not okay. relevant to your, your presentation. Do I need to approve it or not? Uh, no, no, it may mix up because the double uh, booking came up, coming up. It's a technical oh. fault. Don't oh. worry about it. All right. Then. Well, change is very important. And change, we all feel that there should be change and that things should be different. But if we look at our history, we know that change is very difficult. And it seems that, that problems are extremely persistent. And even if you take a system perspective in which you look at the different organizations, how they work together, then you can see if you change something in this aspect, that something another aspect is coming up and that the netto, the result, 
is, is not there what was helpful. So the problems you work on in this new form of public health are not easy. They are really very complex and therefore also very persistent. So to have a, a better understanding of these uh, persistence of the problems, the system of where in which they occur, and then with the help of that better understanding in terms of what are the problems, but also a better understanding of what might be possible, even the process are always there, that is the ultimate goal what you want to achieve. The purpose of the, of the transdisciplinary research, the goal of the research is to have this change and to realize a better health for everybody. Although it is very, very difficult. Now, of course, there are multiple methods to do. And the last point is creativity. And that's very interesting because you can add to creativity almost also enjoyment. Because although the problems are extremely serious and um, they are not and, and difficult and not easy to deal with, still, very often in this type of research, there is an enjoyment. There is an, an, an happiness in terms of being able to sit together and to find out and to learn and to develop new pathways. And if this creative can be used to identify synergy between the culture and the, uh, and the solution in terms of uh, in terms of the change, what is going to happen, synergies between the positions of several groups and every thing works a little bit smoother. So to identify these ways of making the process flow is with the help of creativity and is extremely important. So if you will be using, when we will be using this methodology, we really will challenge your creativity and it, you will see it gives a lot of joy. Now you cannot see this slide, which is very good. Because if I tell you all this, I think that many of you, of the students, feel, oh, is this you not all? Oh, sorry, yes. it, you may have to cancel. There are double slides. There are two screens are coming up. Oh. So you, may, you may have to disconnect this. You can do it from your side because okay. it's How not the Okay, so I think look at this list of things and I go. Oh, I still cannot. Yeah. Operate my slides. If you see this list, I'm sure that you think it's too much. It is so demanding and it's even academically solid. Is it doable? And is it can it really have scientific well, good research results? And in any case, in another situation, I hope to also to talk with you about the validity of this methodology and how to increase the validity and how to make it work. But now I have a shift because what if this methodology, transdisciplinary methodology or co-creation of co-production of knowledge? If this was published in the top journal in the world, in, for example, science or nature, and if it would have the same sort of key characteristics, I think that might give you a confidence that it is doable and that it is also respected and that it can be done. And what happens? In January this year, in the in the Journal of Nature, Nature Sustainability, 
in 20 of 2020, there was an article titled Principles for Knowledge Co-Production in Sustainability Research. So it was published, this work following these principles was published in uh, Nature Sustainability. And what did they say? They say knowledge co-production for sustainability research has four different um, components. It should be context-based. Well, that we already understood. It is important because to know the context, you need to know the context in which you do the intervention. It should be pluralistic. And this is a very making explicit that you have different perspectives, different views on the same. And you see here a group of people, pluralistic, who all come from different backgrounds and who uh, are allowed, and even through the methodology, are fitting into a process which these different views are uh, made explicit and also made useful into the process. It's goal-oriented. It should have clearly defined goals so that you know, because it's so important, because all the decisions, they are guided by these goals. To go to the left or to the right, if you know the direction you go into, then you have a way of deciding what to do. And also the four is interactive. So creating learning between all the different actors, with active engagement and frequent interventions. So this is the participation of not only having the scientists, but also having the, um, the people from society together in this hopefully creative and enjoyable process. Yeah, it is interesting, but this public health, uh, the new approach to public health resonates with very many interesting developments in society and in science also. So first I spoke about this inspiring nature article, and now I show the link between public health and design science. Design science is an, another field, but the way how design science is organized and have developed knowledge and method uh, is very much uh, the same as what we have discussed now. And in design science, researchers, users, stakeholders, they are considered as equals. So there is no hierarchy. And they identify together the problems and the solutions. And here we see a sort of spiral. You have a problem and you look into the problem more in detail and you process your data and you refine your problem. And this is of course due to the information from all the stakeholders. And you do the same with solutions. So you generate ideas for solutions, evaluate them, build solutions, and go on. So now you understand that these lines from the problem informing the solutions every time when a new cycle is done, a new formula is also happening to specify the solutions. And if the solutions don't fully work out as expected, this information is back to the problem development and the problem development is again. So the new public health uh, um, uh, approach is linked to many different trends in society in, um, and in uh, other fields. Therefore, make it more easy for you as students and practitioners and, and researchers to use methodologies with others because from another perspective they are doing similar sort of things. How they can, what does it mean for your education at World Peace University? Well, here on the right hand what you see is that you have all sorts of inputs, resources, uh, 
in the environment here from MIT, you have Wilpis University. There are many policymakers. Also in the webinars, we see them often. Uh, you have entrepreneurs. Uh, you have interactive uh, visits, co-creation workshops, citizens. So many things are happening within the university and outside the university. And now you know the process of transdisciplinary research. What is now needed is that you try to help developing a sort of living lab, living lab, making use of every knowledge oh, which you can get hold on and people who want to help you and are interested and are motivated and develop a lab and as your uh, as your masters so your masters becomes not only coursework but also designing a lab and doing projects so what have we seen now that there is a shift in the learning and in the teaching there is a shift from more a focus on a discipline so on different fields or subfields in the field of public health towards more a problem and solution focus in a way and i like to say it again in a way which is academically sound and there is a shift for including the not only solution focus, but also many different views and do co-production of knowledge in health. Oh. And absolutely what is important is to get in touch with the real world and identify how people perceive these problems in their daily lives and what they feel are their ideas to do something. Whether it's high in society, CEOs, or whether it's low and the poorest, they are both interested and needed for finding solutions which are sustainable. So what you also need to learn is to work in teams to solve the problems, because these problems are so difficult, you cannot solve them on your own. So you need your colleagues and you need all the other resources as well. And you need to use your creativity and imagination. But that means that for the future, you will develop core competences, new types of core competences. Creative system thinking, system thinking, design thinking is very similar. Research skills, because this is very serious business. You cannot do it a little bit ad hoc. It should be done in a proper research way. Interpersonal skills. Because if people don't speak to you, you don't get information. So how to understand what's happening and communicate, communication, teamwork. And what it means is that if you are able to do this, if you have an understanding of this process and you work with the people towards in your team, towards these solutions, and you include people who give also their contribution. Basically, what you are doing by motivating and including other people is leading, strategic lead. And therefore, I think this new form of public health, it will create and help creating future public health leaders. And we need leaders for many, many, many organizations, all sorts of here and you, the way you can see it is that this training in transdisciplinary research and project work and working together is a training in leadership in terms of making things happen so public health leaders are also sometimes compared with orchestra conductors they set on the bass and the tempo and they encourage the musicians to play with confidence and these can be your colleagues, these can be the people from society. And to have eyes always towards a joint goal, such a motivating goal to realize that one that stimulates everybody. And that is what the public health leader aims to do and will do. And then these leaders are 
not only able or managing crisis like COVID-19 or 29 days starting out, but also they have a looking forward to the future, not crisis only of today, but also for the future. How to realize sustainable system for the future, in which there is health for and I wish you all the joy in your new masters and this interesting field in which India is in such a rich country in terms of experiences of, uh, of, of so many different people who are willing to contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joske. Can you switch off the, that uh, sharing program? Uh -oh. Please exit from my sharing the slide. Do I stop it now? Yeah, please. If it's done, you're done with the slide. Did I Get stop it? On your, on your left hand side, top, you scroll your mouse, then it'll come up. Exit. Yeah, done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joske. As I expected, it was really um, uh, path breaking and it gives more clarity about um, public health, public health skills, and also the, the public health practice. I am quite sure that uh, this, uh, the young recruits to the, the public health fraternity, they must have been, I could see that they are very actively listening to your suggestions and your ideas about um, um, what are the new, new public health. I think probably this is the one thing we are looking at, it, unpacking the idea of new public health. New public health is not about medicine. That's what you never mentioned about the word of medicine. You never mentioned the word of clinic. New public health is about understanding society in a better way. New public health is acquiring new skills for dealing with society and the public health challenges. And new public health is about building institutions. And new public health challenges are the practitioners are building institutions with values, knowledge, capacity, a different thinking framework, system thinking you mentioned, or designer thinking you, you mentioned. So public health practitioners, they, there, is a, there is a difference between old public health and new public health by like day and night. So it is uh, challenging, it's frightening, because the kind of demands you put on the new public health practitioners is phenomenal. And it's also challenging to the teachers because we have to devise ways to ensure that the, the new students are aware of what is the new public health, what skills they have to appear over the period of two years, but how do we discover methodology, skills, and pedagogy to teach new public health? So I, I think you, you open up a great set of challenges for the students, and now it's up to them to ask you a question. I invite, um, you can ask directly to Joske, or you can type it on the, the chat session. But I want you to ask Joske directly because she once our COVID phenomena has moved on, she may be coming to our faculty. She is very well known. She visits, I mean, she used to visit every alternative month and she spent a lot of time understanding and looking into our syllabus and our, not only the public health syllabus and the strategizing how to build the Faculty of Sustainability Studies and School of Public Health. Many of you are being here today that is because of the, the foresight and thinking of uh, Joske. That's the way, let me put it across. And the floor is open for you to ask questions. Thank you. Shari, you, you want to ask a question? I know you are, you're dying to ask something. Go ahead. After Shari, it is Anju's turn. I'm going to give call you names now. Go ahead, please. You unmute. Sorry, you speak up. Your microphone is not working. Okay, um, meanwhile, someone, okay, are you ready? Go ahead. 
Sorry, I can't hear you. I know you are you are speaking, but I can't hear you. Sorry, na. Someone else? Sorry, I can't read sign language. Sorry. Uh, Saumya. Hello. Good evening, Hello. sir. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you too, ma'am. Ma'am, I want to ask as a public health professional. Hello. Um, Hello. Speak. You in introduce yourself and speak. And tell Professor Joske about your background. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, my basically from the dentistry background. Uh, Ma'am, I have noticed uh, as a far as being a public health student that oral health is not uh, uh, discussed so. Uh, profoundly on a worldwide basis. It's not uh, uh, been talked about as a public health uh, perspective that much. So what is your comment on that, ma'am? Yes, I, uh, I, I, I know it, it has been discussed already earlier also in these webinars. Um, I'm myself not an, not an expert in it. But I think it might be an interesting challenge to see how it can become a little bit higher on the policy agenda and, and why, and to, to, to do that also, research on that one. <laughs> uh, just, uh, you have a question from Sarah Yum, and she lost her um, connection, but she is asking a question through the chat session. Can you give a real world application of trans transdisciplinary approach? Uh, yeah, uh, for example, um, uh, there uh, are many people suffering from uh, burn and um, uh, burns, fire uh, burns. And uh, th there was a long time there was no, um, no, nothing which was done in terms of research. And then such a uh, um, such an approach was used by taking different specialists from different uh, fields, uh, so bi biomedical scientists and uh, dermatologists and so on, and also the burn survivors and children with burns, and uh, and they asked them from different first different and later together. What do you feel are the most important problems we to have in burns, and um, and 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 why, and what could be done about it? And um, uh, then the different groups made a sort of priority list, and then the priority list was discussed together between the the scientists and the people from society. And the people from society, the burn survivors, they had this um, itching uh, as the top priority in their on their list of what should be researched. And um, and the um, and the scientists, it was not on their list at all. But after this discussion and dialogue, they re-evaluated their um, their. Um, Priorities and then the, the biomedical uh, scientists, they also prioritized that as number two. So uh, that meant that the Burns organization, together with the government, developed a program and asked researchers how to conceptualize and work on itching. And the first year there was nobody because it was not used, it was not a topic which was done before. So because it was brought in from outside the fields, and uh, there was not any application for the money. And then the second year, there were applications. And, and now it has been a, 
a, a large program, but also a very fun interestingly, a very fundamental program because even the genetic uh, underlying problems were identified and published in um, uh, in, in the top uh, uh, journal. And I, I think, yeah, I, I shouldn't say, but it was a top journal. So it, it, something which had no status at all because it came from from survive, burn survivors uh, got such a lot of interest and led to very interesting um, uh, understandings, but also approaches. Well, th that is basically what you, what you hope what will happen with transdisciplinary approaches. That there is a problem and that you look at it from different sides and and then you, you develop this process of each other better understanding. Why are you saying it? How is it exactly? And that, that's so important information. And that can be done in, in almost all, um, uh, because many uh, problems are very complex. Even policies, uh, to implement policies is, is extremely well. We have here a very special guest from the WHO. I think perhaps she, she can also add to that very much because even policy recommendations to get them implemented need a lot of uh, transdisciplinary thinking. Uh, can I ask please. a question? Please, please go ahead. Maybe, uh, Mina, will you introduce yourself, please? <laughs> well, and I'm uh, just to clarify, I am retired from World Health Organization here in Geneva. Uh, okay. so, and I was the lead for the surgical care program uh, where I, in, in WHO here in Geneva. But right now I am with the uh, director for the you know, surgical care education materials for Geneva Foundation for Medical Education and Research. And the other hat I, I wear is also on the International Society for uh, Geriatric Oncology. That's basically we are looking, uh, we are focused on cancer in the older population. Uh, so that's my background. I'm an anesthesiologist, by the way. So I am a clinician. I was a clinician. And uh, Joski, it was so wonderful to hear you bring another angle to the public health because I I came by default, as Dr. Joe Thomas knows, into WHO by default. I was a purely uh, anesthesiologist um, doing cardiac and plant and all those things that in, in India. And then I came for the first time out of the operate, operating rooms uh, after 22 years into this, uh, the highest level of the public, global public health in yeah. WHO here in Chile at the headquarters. So that's the background just to give, uh, why I gave that background was that I found your talk really very interesting looking at public health. Uh, you know, this is the way uh, I think now people are looking. So I was also exposed to this way of looking at public health. My my uh, question was that uh, uh, in your opinion, uh, uh, how do you think like our countries uh, looking at in this di uh, designs uh, uh, science in a transdisciplinary um, public health point of view, and if so, do you, don't you find differences within the country if they are following that, having taken everybody on board, like you mentioned, the stakeholders, the clinicians, the everybody as equal the users, and in terms of COVID, uh, then uh, we do see or very clear uh, differences in the implementation within the country uh, in many countries. So I would like to hear also the opinion from the students, uh, which would be wonderful to hear their views. And of course, uh, I would like to hear Joski from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. 
uh, your uh, uh, career and how you started and then that you came in WHO and then had to look at many other aspects of policies and social aspects and so on. And now you are again in the next step. So I think we need very much what we need in, in our curriculum and in our masters is access to people like you <laughs> who, who really understand the different perspectives. Because you are a sort of intermediary in my view. You live, you have lived in one world and you also have lived in a third world, second world, and now you live. So you were first in the hospital and then you came at WHO and now you are in NGOs, I understand. And and these are different worlds. So you got, can now speak and 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 think and guide people from so many different perspectives. So it cannot be otherwise than that you are very open to uh, to information from from something new for you because you have done it. You've shown that you have done it already several times, and I think. That, that 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 is exceptional because it seems to me more easier sometimes for younger people to because they are not so much firmly embedded in in one discipline uh, but but you were and, and and you also stepped out but having said that i feel that um uh, that both is needed uh also, specific monodisciplinary research is very important. It needs to go hand in hand. Only then also transdisciplinary research can work. And you say uh, that there are countries, uh, I, I, I read in a review until 2010 about these methodologies and where they were strong. And it, it was, strangely enough, it was Germany and in Europe, in Germany and uh, Switzerland. In the Netherlands, and um, uh, now there is a new handbook about transdisciplinary research, and it's also about Australia and US. So I think in most countries uh, there are uh, places where it happens, and it comes more and more, and it is valued more and more, and there is money for it now in the growth. So I think it will develop. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joske. And um, in fact, I must just narrate a story about uh, my understanding about transdisciplinary public health, how that is expanded by an intervention from uh, Dr. Meena Chirian. I never knew that uh, surgery is part of primary care. When she told me that surgery is also primary care, I thought, my goodness, what are you talking about? Finally, it's ended up in doing a, a major study on uh, surgical care needs in primary care settings in Bangladesh. It's a published in the International Journal of Surgery. It's an eye opening for me. You need surgical care even in the primary care setting. And it should be part of the primary care health care minimum package. It's really a revelation for me because surgical care is understood as at the hospital clinics, at the, at the, at the, at the operation theater. But how sometimes you know, some people can expand your understanding about health and health uh, and the well-being and the, the boundaries of public health. And uh, you complimented Joske to that uh, Dr. Mina's question. Uh, anyone else wanted to use this opportunity to ask um, or directly interact with um, Professor Joske? If not, I have a question for I would like to ask you, if you listen to this, uh, this lecture or this, uh, um, what do you think? So can, can you all give me one or two sentences about how you feel about it? Is it attractive or is it a bit uh, too much? Uh, bit, how, how do you feel about it when you, when, when you follow me? Yes, please, can, can you? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Yeah, you... I'm, uh, hello. Am I audible, ma'am? You are, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Ma'am, it was very, a very informative session for us because we all are from different backgrounds and knowing that how as a public health practitioner we should go ahead and what should we be focusing on and coming from different backgrounds, we are still somewhere uh, 
stuck with uh, our undergrad subjects that how we can you know in, include that as a public health uh, sec- include that in the public health sector but after listening to your session and understanding that a view of the society is more important it inspires us to know more about the local communities because somewhere down the line during my years as a student of uh, homeopathy i've known that local communities are missed when it comes to public health Uh, yeah. and awareness is very important so the society point of view and the institution point of view that is really encouraging to study further very interesting thank you thank you ma'am thank you very much mm-hmm. can you perhaps also react sir Anybody else say a few words? Is it not frightening? <laughs> I, for me, I I found it a little uh, an overwhelming and challenging because our notions about public health is a very secured boundaries, and uh, we we don't get into the details of uh, looking at a new way of thinking. We don't look at um, uh you know acting as uh, advocacy for pro- social transmission so what you are asking us is you know and uh, expanding the boundaries of public health particularly in, in practicing public health in indian context ma'am i want to ask you something uh, regarding it's it's quite a different i just wanted to ask you something like uh whenever we uh, just plot some uh, research topic or something like that or we uh, think about a strategy we are often much frightened about the limitations or the problems we are going to face that so can you please uh, uh, just enlighten us how to deal with that situation like whenever yeah what uh, yeah, what, no. what was the limitation what were we whenever we are thinking of a topic or something uh, a strategy to work upon uh, yeah. we are very much uh, particular very much uh, concerned about the limitations as first that if we are going to do this this limitations are going to be there some problem is going to be occurred so uh, can you please enlighten us to handle this yes. uh, being a yeah yeah i like i like it quite the question very much and it is interesting that you yourself are coming up with this question um so there is already a lot of awareness otherwise you would not have asked it and um uh, every small project even if it is half a day can be extremely interesting so there should also be small steps perhaps a step that you sit together with with you amongst yourself in a small group three four and what are topics do we really like very much what what is our heart opens for and then you you discuss the topic together and you say can we do a research you also discuss with of the job and uh, and and then you find out and then i am really a believer in students i think that their patients I see only things, and and sometimes I see a feeling of uh, um, uh, of a limitation. But then, if you can discuss together, or with some friends, or support from any side, if 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 you feel that if that you would like really something to understand and find out people who can give you some clues of what can be done. it gives you such a joy that you forget the limitations and you don't need to publish immediately in nature so i mean it's first it's this first trying to do something uh, in a learning capacity but at the same time learning and doing is integrated and interesting in this university they also have field visits in villages where you can get the ids and many other ways are there and i think that that you can be extremely proactive in in finding ways and 
working together and finding support groups. I'm offering myself as a support person <laughs> to 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 help the group going and to 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 also to use methods who are there and which work beautifully and which gives you results which can be first reported as a result of your study, but also the, the results of the discussion groups which you can organize, even in a virtual world, you can do it. There is nothing which makes you cannot do this and disciplinary research uh, because of COVID. People have sometimes more time uh, and are always interested if students are eager to, to ask them about their knowledge and how their view and what is their dream. And, and and why? What are the obstacles for that dream? And then, and then you can get inspired. And perhaps it is also aligned with your dream. And every time you can do a small thing. Perhaps you can start by writing uh, a, a column in a newspaper or on on online or whatever. But it, if it is in part of the, the the curriculum, then it's just serious work. And I don't see limitations. You are all very, very intelligent and creative. I know that because I've been often in your place. Uh, Joske, in fact, all of them are doing a, a joint project. They're looking at um, the nutrition in India. They have a joint project. In fact, yeah. today was today was the uh, the last day to submit the concept note. How they're going to do it? And our idea is each one is right separately. Then finally, we'll compile it and see how this is going to put together. And each one is looking at different aspects of public health. This is a mini project. This is not the main thesis. That's at the second year. That the final year dissertation also, they started thinking about it. We had a two rounds of discussion. What will be their major thesis at the end of the second year? We started discussing about it. And there's a possibility that it can be uh, created or transformed into a transdisciplinary studies, but immediately we are doing a project on nutrition and, and public health in the Indian context. Thank yeah, you. I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it is very good to start small. And, and, and to, to do it in a way it's, it's enjoying. I mean, you look at internet, you find experts, you call them, you, you ask, is it possible to have a short interview of 15 minutes or so? And, and then they say, all of a sudden they say yes. And, and and then you are so happy and you say, ah, oh, he talks with me. <laughs> and that can all be done. Yeah, now you are in a meeting with somebody who had a very high position in WHO. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. I know, maybe, maybe they could interact with you about their um, this nutrition project. Yeah. Because many people, they ask me what, what they should be focusing and they let me deflect some of the questions to you. But it uh, is also I... together, that they do together. Okay, I, I have a question from a Shamil Pant and the question is in the COVID pandemic, we have certain restrictions for calling, collecting data. Surveys for projects, so with limited field work, how are we supposed to go ahead with, this, with the research? Is it a question for me or for? Yeah, it's a question for you. It's a, one of the yeah. questions came from the participants through uh, our chats, chat box. Yeah. Yeah, field work is a problem. And we have also, we have here uh, in this institute now 250 master's students. And, uh, and then many of them used to go to India and to uh, everywhere in the world in, for their global master, research master global health. And probably it's not possible to do it. But um, I've seen so beautiful internet uh, online interviews and, uh, and together with group discussions, focus group discussions among the students themselves and then including some other experts. And of course, it, it's, it's difficult to, to get access to the, the poor and the marginalized uh, and, and that's an issue. But uh, perhaps still, I think that if you sit together, you will find solutions for also for this. I got in my mailbox a very small uh, letter with a golden uh, or a, a, a yellow thread 
and it say it's COVID time and we need to do our field work. So if you don't mind, visit uh, the people of this house. <laughs> so so I, I'm sure if you if you say to each other tomorrow we would like ten solutions for doing it in COVID time, I'm sure you will have ten solutions. Um, Joske, there is a question from um, uh, Sarayu. She is asking how to focus on public health aspects of a problem when we are surrounded with clinical issues. But, pardon, can you repeat? How can we? How to, how to focus on public health aspects of a problem when we are surrounded with uh, clinical issues? Yeah. Should uh, I repeat? I would say... Sorry? I, how to focus on on yeah. public health aspect of a problem when we are surrounded with uh, clinical issues? I, I agree, but <clears throat> I think if you look at, <clears throat> at clinical issues like COVID, so 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 called clinical issues have oft, often many many social aspects as well. I mean, clinical um, what clinical issues? For example, in terms of testing or in terms of hospital or in terms of lack of um, intensive care. Uh, these are all policy dis discussions also about where to focus on, where to have the resources on. So, so clinical issues are not only solved by clinical practices, but also by organizational practices and policy practices and understanding what are bottlenecks. So perhaps these issues can be seen from this side. If they are now very urgent. Okay, um, you know, okay, there is no more questions in the chat box right now. Yeah, if anything yeah. Comes, yeah. Uh, can I uh, answer one of the uh, related to these questions? Um, it's about, uh, you know, using at this time of COVID and uh, using the, I think it was also for me, it said, Mina and Joske, ma'am, could you please give us your views about the MPH students should look at public health problems through a window of clinical health, uh, how to focus on public health as a problem when we are surrounded with clinical issues. I think, uh, you know, if one thing that COVID has, has done for many of the academics and people uh, and is a, is a, uh, you know, to look at it positively is that it gave you time to think uh, in a much more structured manner because before this we were we were just doing the task of you know finishing that project and things. So using this time, uh, I I I recently also uh, got one one of the proposals to say that in a particular place in India. Uh, there's a lot of malnutrition to the extent yeah. that one in three, one in three children, and uh, the children's names are also are named like tomorrow in that uh, in the vernacular language. So there itself, you know, COVID is happening, but then you can in this uh, time you can also have interaction and a very uh, this is this will be transdisciplinary approach that uh, uh, Dr. Joski just mentioned in this lecture is connecting with people who are requiring research. Uh, they're having a topic, they're having a problem and yeah. Yeah. they are helping you. And these are not people. Uh, the person that sent me is a very, very uh, uh, how to say, accomplished uh, uh, community health professor. So, but uh, working in a very uh, remote place. So it just, you were talking and you were talking about nutrition, it just came to my mind that this is how it works, that could we, you know, look into something like that it, as a project where they would do the groundwork because you cannot travel, but you still have this input, both from the clinician, from public health, yes, health, and you know, in a very and and the people on the ground, the community. So it just gave me an idea, and I thought I I should share with you. Oh, thank you, thank you. You know that is very informative. 
insightful. Thank you. Any other question? Soham, you have any question? Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. I, I have a question uh, to you, uh, Joski, ma'am. The Mina, ma'am. Uh, uh, in uh, concern. Please, please go ahead. Can you? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Maybe introduce yourself and uh, tell Joske about your background. <clears throat> then you present your question. Oh. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, my name is uh, Soham Bangar, and I am a, a pharmacist by profession. Uh, 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 for the mini project uh, on the nutrition, the topic uh, the nutrition challenges uh, in the indigenous community in the India. In concern with this topic, I have I uh, love to ask about the. Uh, how we communicate or how uh, we uh, put our ideas or our uh, all the works in in front or the they can uh, uh, communicate with us for the for our uh, better improvement of the problem can you get me sir yeah go ahead i just i hope you may be able to answer this if I fully understand, um, my experience is that uh, people are um, very sensitive that if you would like to push a certain ID, then they uh, say yes, yes, but don't think long, long about it. But if you are very open to those people and say, this was an ID, and what do you think? Would it be possible? Could it work perhaps in your community or not? What 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 might it difficult? What makes it difficult? So if you are very open and you are really interested in them, how they think about it, then they usually will answer. But uh, yeah, they... yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, before that, I uh, worked uh, with them with like uh, with uh, one of the indigenous com uh, community in India. At Chhattisgarh, uh, I work there. I uh, I put my in concern with nutri nutrition or the non-communicable diseases. But sometimes I am very interested or I am work very hard for that policy or what they what I do for them. But uh, they are not accepting anymore because they have their rituals and uh, all other things in their communities. So how can we deal with that? Uh, uh, about the uh, getting plan okay for or getting plan uh, for them is the strategy or do the hard work on the field or the some things yeah this is very difficult issue because um, they sometimes they may be very to to keep their rituals because sometimes they they are rituals which may preserve certain food or seeds, or I mean, there may be many things behind it, behind the rituals, uh, which very much makes sense. So to say, we need to replace them by other things. Um, if they say no, then they are very clear. And 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 I think, as a scientist, you need to be interested why they say no. There must be a reason, and you must give them credit for being so open and honest to you and not telling something, yes, we would like to do it, but sometimes I have to do something else. Yeah. So I think this is a very open uh, open behavior, which, which, which is to be applauded and, and gives you the opportunity to say, I fully respect what you say, but I like so much to understand it because if I am in other villages, perhaps the same thing happens and I like to learn from you. What, what what is the motivation behind this? It's not that the, you if you start with willing them to change, 
what you want is a is a goal is an is a thing that there is more access or more access for health and and so on and and more opportunities and more participation but to say it's difficult to say that this is better for you than that we are almost not in a situation that we can say that yes sir, definitely thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you thank you very much Interesting question, by the way. Very interesting. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> what, what what do you think, Mina, about this? Yeah, yeah. Would you like I, to add? Yes, this? yeah. Actually, you you've summed it all, and I think what you what I think he could take uh, the message is that we have to respect when they say no. But at the same time, I I could add on that comment is that uh, many times if you you can't become part of them, but if you are able to meet them, and if you are able to talk with the their local uh, senior, you know, person who has a voice who gives them the uh, yes or no actually. You know, uh, I don't know how in, in, in UP we call him Sarpanch and, and, and like that. But uh, I don't know, this girl, what you call. But somebody more uh, powerful uh, has a say. And then it, it uh, and then you say to that person just exactly what Dr. Joski said, that I want to learn. Because this is something new that you are telling me, uh, which is not known. And therefore, I have come to learn as to, you know, maybe what you are saying is correct. That maybe your rituals and your traditional meals, what you are giving, has more uh, uh, power or is more beneficial. Then I have come here to learn. And because I, I was on the understanding, this is what I know. Then you, are, you become like you are learning from them and you have uh, you came like that but now you have come like you've become under that and you're learning and then slowly you will find you're part of them you've gained enough confidence and then again on the top you can say that this is what if you do let's try if it works good doesn't even then you still got the thesis or your topic because then you can say the reasons and somebody mentioned the limitations rather than jumping on the limitations before the the starting the project you already then have in your conclusion the limitations as to what you did try and this is what happened and really like uh, has been mentioned the honesty really really uh, is seen in a thesis it's seen in a paper and it really reflects and you gain a lot with being honest with them Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I have a lot. I, I, I clear a lot much confusion and uh, enlightening thoughts from you. Thank you so much. That will help me in future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Min. And uh, thank you, Soham, for asking that question. We can take uh, two or three questions more. Anyone else wanted to go? Maybe the students who are, uh, who are not showing their face, maybe I, I, let me ask questions to them. <laughs> Sainimba, you wanted to ask a question? No, you run away, so you don't have to answer. So who else? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Very clear, yeah. loud and clear. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I don't really have a question. I found the presentation ex extremely interesting. Um, what I wanted to say to Soham is like, I've studied uh, extension education for three years. And in that it's basically how you uh, introduce programs to indigenous, uh, introduce new programs to people. So in that one of the main things they always told to us is you can't approach to them thinking that you know better than them. You have to say that you are here to tell them something new and if they like it they can take uh, accept it 
and what uh, meena ma'am told that you have to always approach the person in the area who is most revered by them who is most respected so you know it's, it's more likely that they will accept the idea than the, than from us because we are an outsider to the community and they will think that we are just here to abra uh, tear, like um, damage their lives not improve it because everyone thinks change is um, not very easily accepted because um, you know it, it abrupts our daily lives so that was the main thing that i to i studied for 3 years and all 3 years they told us this every time we made a new program then you have to make sure that they understand that you are not here to damage or up to destroy their lives it's here to improve their lives thank you yeah thank you sanaba that is very very insightful oh, sorry um the in insightful contribution that reminds me during my early field work days i've been told that you should do a community needs assessment before you do anything exactly yes that's what they also told us that you have to know you have to physically be on ground before you make a very extensive plan to know how the field actually looks for sitting in uh, sitting in the background and assuming how things are will most probably not give you that good of a result than as going there and seeing what people think and what their issues are from them personally ah uh, thanks sanaba outside of we might think oh this and so and so is the problem for them but when we go there they will they will say that this is not our problem this is the problem we are facing yeah i can tell you the same story because i have been asked to install hand pumps you know the the very basic hand pump for the, for drinking water and uh, I, this was in a one one small strip of land right beside a highway and a seashore so seashore you don't get the water so you had to cross the highway to get the fresh water so uh, i thought you know people are going to queue up for the, i had about 100 hand pumps to install in about 5 km uh, uh, radius and i was thought oh i was very excited that i am going to give water pump to everybody people will be queuing up outside my office to get the water pump so i was feeling very great about it i went to the community then i asked to do you want a water pump i mean technic i mean you don't believe it everybody said no i don't want a water pump then i sort of what happened i went back to the office they said you didn't do a need assessment that's why okay i called for the need assessment you know there is a i don't know whether you know about something called petrol max this a lamp is a huge one tradition in the village there is no electricity so i arranged everything and arranged coffee tea for the and they said we are very busy we arranged a meeting late evening so so we arranged a meeting at around 7 o'clock and i thought people are going to arrange the table benches everything i arranged and guess what finally two or three men came so i never thought about you know the wider thing i thought they busy they didn't come so then i said you know okay we are here to discuss about water installation water pump so one guy he stood up and said what are you talking about my wife is unemployed he is sitting at home let her walk across and get go and get some water <laughs> and everybody clapped and then then this for area it is a telephone booth and i you know that i went for installing water pump they said no 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 the priority is uh, mobile phone i'm sorry uh, telephone booth a public telephone booth the pre mobile phone area then i asked why telephone booth you talking about i am talking about water pump they said that's the time he said all these women in this community are not doing anything let them go and get some water they don't let them do some work but the men get in the evening they get drunk they fight with each other we should call, call the police next time when they fight with each other so you should get us a, a, a public telephone booth imagine so my entire water project was finished so my lesson learned much later i was so flabbergasted i didn't know what happened what hit me because my office people said you know you don't even know how to install 100 water pump we gave you such an opportunity you couldn't even install one pump but later on i realized needs assessment is based on the gender bias the men decided who should get the water pump you know what was the justification they said if the water pump is near my house people come to collect water any every, every time in late night early morning and late night people come to near my house to collect water and they'll fight with each other they create noise and i may not be able to sleep properly so don't have any water pump near my house look at the the dynamics of who is deciding in a community and what is the community needs 
and I couldn't resist, but actually I had to abandon the project of these 100 pumps. And finally, what I did is that, you know, there is a small club, youth club. So the club coordinator, I told him, please help me with installing one. So he installed one in front of the, the club. There is a small hut and one behind. I asked him, one to why one, one in the front, one in the back. He said, the front one is for drinking water. The behind one will take a shower into the bath. <laughs> so out of 100, I installed two. So this is my experience of installing a great drinking water project and doing the needs assessment. Just giving an another side of the needs assessment. But remember, needs assessment in the public health also, who decides who set the agenda? Yes. So this is one of the issues I wanted to bring home. Josuke, back to you. Two words. Anything to add? Any other questions? Anything, any more questions? Otherwise, you know, we can wind up after wind up maybe after one or two questions. You want to share any stories? <laughs> we, I was in Bangladesh and uh, they had uh, drinking water which was polluted with arsenic uh, poisoning, uh, arsenic pollution. It is natural, it's in the soil, it comes from the Himalayas. And uh, the Japanese uh, people had come and they had painted all water pumps red or green so they were fine or they were polluted and the idea was that then the villagers could take only those who had the green the green pumps but there was a village uh, which only had the red pumps and um, so we went there and we we had an, 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 a, a project or not and in several steps. So we asked them whether they would participate in the project. And then they said, yes, we wouldn't mind, but first you put here a school because there is a road next to this village and, and the school is on the other side of the road. And very often our children die at, at, the, at the road by cars. So if you make make sure that there is a school here, then we will participate. And I was so amazed. And and I found out there was a teacher in the class in the village. So we just started to a school which cost almost nothing. And and uh, the, and they were happy that the children did not have to travel. And we also did our water pump. But I felt it was very determined negotiation and 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 also openness so we enjoyed it <laughs> but yeah it's a bit similar but different <laughs> yeah this field work also brings in very fascinating experience any of you you wanted to share your field work experience and particularly from a transdisciplinary perspective any 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 uh, exciting or disappointing experience Um, thank you very much, Joske. It was fabulous. It's fantastic. It is uh, six o'clock, and uh, all of them they they stayed through. And uh, let me thank Mina particularly. And um, this the master's program, public health program in MIT World Peace University is the first batch, and um, uh, it's exciting as well as it's, it's uh, frightening because we have a very specific body of knowledge we are trying to create a non-clinical public health perspective with all the due respect to mena this is not a, 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 a clinician versus public health that's not the case in my understanding what you're talking about is a continuum of public health from the community to the clinic that continuum we have to work out in a proper balance that that is the challenge for the particular indian context because when we talk about um, the health system in the multiplicity the complexity I mean, it's exactly what you're talking about, the complexity of public health. How do you describe it? How do you analyze it? 
what tools we have to understand the complexity from a, a public health perspective. Because clinical decision making, we have set parameters, set, set protocol. But at the same time, applying that in the social context, public health context, social structural context, we have difficulty. The, the basic example is what is happening out there, the raging COVID pandemic. We have the expertise, we have the knowledge about how to prevent COVID pandemic. But imagine, just look at it, it's going out of hand all over the all over the world. It's not only one region, one locality, it's a truly global pandemic. <clears throat> at the same time, it seems public health leadership is hesitant to take up and, and go with it and looking at the research coming out and looking for solution. Interestingly, the biggest silence of public health practitioners to look at COVID pandemic, I would say that is the biggest silence. That is, I mean, the, 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 the sound of silence is unbearable. Because unless public health explanation about why the COVID pandemic is rapidly spreading, and the, I mean, the, the, the multiplicity of in the short span of time, it has to come from not from a clinical scientist. It has to come from public health practitioners. So this is a message we are taking home from the, this very correctly you hi highlighted the issue of multiplicity and the, the complexity and the transdisciplinary approach towards health. And the take home message is that public health practitioners, public health students, there's a huge responsibility, not only an academic responsibility, there's a great social responsibility, a responsibility of leadership, responsibility of, uh, responsible analytical skills, responsibility of thinking be outside the box. So this was a message from Joske, and I hope you are either uh, reasonably frightened or reasonably inspired. <laughs> and I hope you're reasonably inspired. And I'm here to go with you. I'm here to as a co-traveler. And um, I thank Joske for taking us forward. And I hope we will have a future interaction as well. And as a regular uh, participant of our conferences, I would like to invite and thank Mina that probably you may share with us some of your experience in future as well, looking at public health from other side of the road. So maybe that could be the, the, the title <laughs> of your presentation. And uh, let me thank all of you. Thank, thank you very much, Yosuke. We look forward to seeing you in person once the COVID uh, hysteria is settled down a little bit, probably next year sometime. And uh, I thank my students particularly. Thank you very much and uh, have, a, have a good night. Bye bye. We are signing off. And sorry, I just wanted to thank people around the Facebook. We have a large audience there, and um, including um, um, I, I can see Dr. Jay Gore. He is a board member of our MIT World Peace University. He is speaking from um, Boston, United States. We have a visitor, Dr. Rabia, from uh, New York again. So we have a truly uh, global audience with us. And on the on the this uh, uh, Cisco as well as on the Facebook. So thanks for the technology as well. Good night again. Bye. Good night. Thank you very much. All the best for the students. <laughs> also, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward. Yeah.